Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm so <coughs> grateful that I get to host Adam today at Google. And I just wanted to give a little bit of intro. Um, Adam has over 20 years of combined experience in informal education. First, building successful creative businesses, uh, business ventures, and then applying the same entrepreneurial spirit within the nonprofit sector. As the director of Global Studios at the Exploratorium, Adam is responsible for furthering the museum's mission of transformative education by building partnerships with and then providing creative services to institutions around the world. For five years prior to his current role, Adam was the director of exhibit development at the Exploratorium. Prior to that, Adam was an award-winning toy inventor and founder of two successful educational toy development and manufacturing companies. Adam also moonlights as a mechanical artist, creating large kinetic contraptions that attempt to create, capture the whimsy of his earlier toy creations. Adam holds a BA from Brandeis University with concentrations in music's, music and physics. So welcome, Adam, to Google. And so thank you so much. Um, it's really good to be here. Um, as I was preparing for this talk, I mean, the first thought I had is, this is easy. I have so much to talk about with the Exploratorium. I can't wait to get up there and share. And then I got afraid because I realized I have so much to share and so much to talk about. There's no way I'm going to fit this in in the time allotted. And then I kind of found a happy medium where I realized, OK, I'm going to find a focus for how we talk about the Exploratorium and the breadth of our work. Um, there are several members of my team here today, so if they all jump up and start waving their hands, that means that I'm taking too long. And I'll try and find a way to start moving through all the material we have to share. Um, before we talk about the work that we do all around the world, I think it's important to be grounded first in what the Exploratorium is, who we are, and a, a little bit of our history. Um, many of you, particularly those of you in the Bay Area, will know the Exploratorium as a place that has interactive and hands-on exhibits. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. What many people don't know is, indeed, the breadth and impact of the Exploratorium as an institution over its 45-year history. Some facts. Uh, uh, we've created over 1,000 interactive exhibits. They are used in 80% of the, the science centers all around the world. We uh, estimate around 200 million visitors a year are using these exhibits and programs, and that's probably a conservative estimate. Um, we have a website that has 11 million hits per year with 50,000 pages of content. We were named as one of the most influential nonprofits, one of the 12 most influential nonprofits of the last half century. So there is so much going on at the Exploratorium that puts us in a position to work with the wider world in the way that we do. So starting with a little bit of history. The Exploratorium was founded in 1969 by Frank Oppenheimer, a brother of Robert Oppenheimer, and they worked side by side on the Manhattan Project. Frank was a lifelong educator with a passion for education and had notions about creating a way of learning that was hands-on, interactive, learner-driven, and felt there was a need to transform education as, as we knew it. Before the Exploratorium, if you were to go to a science center, it was largely artifact-based. It was a place that you would see the artifacts of science or the history of science. So the way we think of science centers right now is a place where you put your hands on experiments and authentic phenomena, by and large, didn't exist. And the Exploratorium played a critical role in, in creating what we now know as the informal science center movement. Our original home was at the Palace of Fine Arts. Uh, the famous story is in 1969, one day they just opened the doors, people came in, and the museum was declared open. About two years ago, we moved to our new location, uh, the San Francisco waterfront on the Embarcadero. It was an incredibly transformative time for the institution, and in many ways directly relates to the ways in which we started interfacing with the wider world. We're more centrally located. We started thinking more broadly about the way in which we partner with people, the way in which we uh, uh, approach content, and even the types of 
content sets that we are able to explore, not to mention the fact that it is significantly more accessible. For those of you who know where the Palace of Fine Arts is, it's out in the edge of San Francisco by the Golden Gate Bridge. I strongly suspect that a strong portion of visitors who tried to get to the Exploratorium ended up on the Golden Gate Bridge. And now we're on public transportation. We're more accessible to a wider variety of communities, including the South Bay and the East Bay. What makes the Exploratorium so special, uh, and one of the reasons it's had the impact it has, is its approach. And I'd actually like to take a moment to talk about some of the core elements of our approach. And the first, and perhaps the most important, is that we have a deep pedagogical underpinning that is about inquiry-based learning. And simply put, that means that it's learner-driven. You form your own questions. You create your own experience. You create your own pathways. You create your own interest. Uh, uh, as opposed to somebody telling you, this is the thing that you're studying, this is the thing you're supposed to be learning, these are the questions that we expect you to answer. This is one of our most famous exhibits. It's a turntable exhibit. And basically, it's a rotating table with a bunch of objects that you place on it and spin and observe what happens. There is no sign. There is no explicit content. And yet, it's about engagement. It's about play. It's about hands-on understanding of the universe. Should you choose then to explore content, obviously there's an awful lot of physics that's going on below the surface, enough to keep a classroom or even a, a university student occupied should you go that direction. We believe in authentic phenomena. So the exhibits on the Exploratorium floor, they're not models, they're not simulations, they are the real phenomena. And that dates all the way back to our founding where uh, uh, the exhibits started off as props, as experiments that you actually get your hands on. And this is an exhibit uh, uh, called Water Drop Photography, where you can time how long it takes for a water drop to fall into a cup of water. Then you take a picture. And you can time where the water droplet is in its journey when you take the picture. There's also unexpected phenomena. If you were to look inside the droplet of water, you see the lens and you see the upside down image. Again, you start with play and interactivity, not the lesson about optics and lenses. Art and science is another fundamental part of the Exploratorium core approach that we believe that the processes of art, the processes of discovery of art and science are very similar. And the beauty of natural phenomena and an artistic approach provides a rather profound toehold for lunars. So this is a picture inside the new Exploratorium. And the, the last fundamental aspect I would touch on right now is that of accessibility and the power of creative engines and a sense of perpetual, constant prototyping. This is our shop, which is very unusual for museums, is right next to our floor. There's only a small, a short pony wall in between visitors and machine shop tools. And that was how it was in the old building, and that is how it is in the new building. It didn't have to be that way, but we insisted that it be so, in large part to demonstrate the fact that there is no magic. Here is where the Exploratorium is being created. And those who are creating it have direct access to the floor and are constantly testing out their ideas on our floor. We don't presume to get an exhibit right or an experience right until we have prototyped it significantly. I'll quickly show a few of our galleries. This is our central gallery. It's probably the most similar to the old Exploratorium. We'll find classic exhibits on light, uh, optics, perception, listening. And if you look, it's actually a rather understated building. It's a beautiful building. But the focus is on the exhibits and the experiences, not so much the, the design and the space around it. The new building also gave us a chance to explore new content areas, including sociology as a content set. This is a, a, an exhibition on the science of sharing. We have an East Gallery uh, that's about uh, uh, biology and natural systems. And because of our new location, uh, if right now you were to zoom into this picture and look to the west, you would see the skyline of San Francisco. And if you were to look to the east, you would see the bay and all of the natural surroundings. So we created an observatory, which is a place where you can well, observe what's going on and try and make sense of what are rather complex systems, the intersections perhaps of natural and, and human-made phenomena. We also have a large outdoor campus. Uh, outdoor exhibits are not new to us, but to have space on our own campus where we can be exploring outdoor surroundings was a wonderful opportunity of the new building. So we began creating experiences outside. This is an anamorphic bench. Uh, anamorphosis is the, the way in which an image is uh, adapted, mutated, if you looked in a curved surface. So we reversed it and put the mutated image in the real world. And if you look on the cylinder, you see a rectangular bench. We created a mobile camera obscura. There are rickshaws going up and down the Embarcadero in San Francisco. 
So again, authentic phenomena, there's a periscope that comes out the top, and this is indeed a mobile camera obscura out on the Embarcadero. Now I've been talking a lot about exhibits, but as I said before, that is just part of what the Exploratorium is, an important part. But we are also learning designers. We are also, we teach professional educators all around the world. Uh, we have trained thousands of teachers in the fundaments of inquiry-based learning. And we take uh, uh, the same approach to exhibits uh, and we apply it using found objects uh, uh, for classroom exercises. We're also a cultural center. So the Exploratorium benefits from being in San Francisco uh, immensely. In large part, it is who we are, the fact that we were born here. This is an example of an after dark event uh, in the evenings. It's just adults. And it's scientists and lecturers and artists. And it's actually quite an event. Uh, you can have as many as five, six, 7,000 people in an evening. It's all adults. Uh, and it's a much different kind of experience. But you, it shows the power of community and the type of convening space the Exploratorium can be. We also try to be fearless whenever we can. Uh, some of you who have been to Burning Man will recognize El Popo Mechanico. This was actually its final uh, performance, if you will, and part of our on the move from uh, the Palace of Fine Arts to the Piers. And this was a, a group called uh, Obscura Digital uh, at our opening that projected on the facade of the Exploratorium uh, uh, um, these wonderful images in a project called Emergence. Um, and it was something you could see up and down the Embarcadero. Now, I'm here to talk about our global impact. Um, all of this has been San Francisco. So how do you take this and apply it? How do you take this and make it extensible for the rest of the world? This Exploratorium has a long history of working with partners all around the world. And it started out, by and large, with us reproducing our exhibits that we were so famous for. In 1985, IBM approached the Exploratorium about reproducing our exhibits for a new gallery that was opening in New York. It's not something we had done. It's not something we had thought about. And we said, of course, we'll do that. And that was the beginning, the genesis, of a way in which not only were we uh, an inspiration to institutions around the world and copied by institutions around the world, we started formalizing partnerships with them. That is the genesis of what has become Global Studios. Global Studios is a new name. It's an outgrowth of that work we've done over the years in exhibit fabrication and replication. And there are a few uh, uh, key aspects that make our relationship successful and have allowed us to grow. The first is we'd like to be as far upstream in the creative process as possible. We don't like to just reproduce what we've done. We like to have an understanding of the unique and individual needs and circumstances of anybody that we work with. We like to bring our in intellectual capital to bear and draw from as many people within the Exploratorium as possible and make it a two-way learning street. We don't presume, again, to have the answers. So for us, one of the great benefits of the work we do is not only are we disseminating or sharing, we're learning and bringing in. Um, and uh, uh, let me continue on and talk about three, three projects that I think are exemplars of, of our core approach for the wider world. Uh, the first is a partnership that we have with Tubatak in Turkey. Tubatak is an analog to our National Science Foundation in the United States. A number of years ago, they decided uh, in a rather bold move that they were going to create science centers in every province in Turkey. So that would be 81 science centers. The government earmarked a substantial amount of money. And one of the first science centers was in a province called Kujeli. Kujeli, if you see Turkey up here, is uh, east by uh, southeast from Istanbul. And the, the center, the capital of Kujeli, is a town called Izmit. So, the museum was going to be created in an old uh, paper mill factory. It's a really cool building. And the way we partnered with them was not necessarily just to create a museum. We actually expanded our partnership to include professional development, capacity building, design, master planning, and of course, exhibit fabrication. So there's going to be a series of these pictures you know, where somebody's looking at a, a drawing and they're, they're pointing and it looks like they're having important thoughts. This is the first. But around the table is uh, members of Tubatak, members of the municipality from Kajeli, and our own team. And we started off by taking a, a 20,000 foot view of what they were trying to accomplish from a, a science objective perspective. And we began laying out what kinds of experiences would fit naturally within their museum. Now, <laughs> I include this picture because uh, Part of the work we do all around the world means we have to respond to the rhythms and tempo 
of our partners. We were just having a conversation earlier about how we tend to move slowly at the Exploratorium. Well, other projects tend to move a lot more quickly. We had to design this entire museum in three months, right at the time that we were moving. So we created the Kajeli sweatshop. And in this room were about 10 uh, engineers, designers, education professionals, all working pretty much around the clock to try and meet what was a government deadline in order to open their museum. That led, of course, to a layout and plan for the museum broken out by content set, creating 3D models of what the experience would look like. And I think it's also important to point out that, as I said before, it wasn't just about creating an experience and transplanting it. It was about the intersection of cultures and human capital. So we created a professional development program that would accompany the exhibits and designs that we created, the experience that we created. And we did trainings both at the Exploratorium and over in Kajeli, Turkey. There were trainings about how you might facilitate the exhibits, how you might scaffold them and do broader learning experiences, and even workshops on the nature of the organization and how you might create a viable, sustainable institution. Both here and in Turkey. And you can see here, these are some of the classic exploratorium exhibits, this is, uh, activities. This is the, the Kawai dissection. And you know, I always like this picture because it, it shows a sense of play and wonder. It's very easy to turn this into a mechanical process, and it's very easy to get into layouts and designs. But the truth in the end is it's about affect, and it's about the wonder and the joy that comes with these kinds of experiences. And if the staff doesn't have that, if the culture doesn't have that, then it's awfully hard to translate that to visitors. So a big part of our intersection of, of, of cultures and the professional development we do is providing the opportunities for that level of inspiration. We also sent a team over to Turkey to build out a shop. It was our hope from the very beginning when we were doing the master planning that we would help them build the capacity to develop and create and, and maintain their own exhibits. So we sent over a team that started refurbishing a number of exhibits on site in Turkey, working side by side with their Turkish counterparts. This was the opening of the museum a, a couple months ago. And as you can tell by the picture, it's a deeply political event. The government got a chance to crow about the investment that they made and the impact of what they created. Um, it's a very different culture than ours in many ways. And the approach to it is very different. And I'll touch on that a little bit later, that that has been a profound learning experience for us. And we have so much more to learn about the assumptions we would make about our culture and the, the situation we have and the benefits we have about how we create these kinds of experiences where another culture might have an entirely different suite of obstacles and, and benefits. This is the president of Turkey uh, uh, on the walkthrough with, with the, the cohort around him. I think you can see myself in the background trying to keep a safe and respectful distance and act casual. <laughs> and this is some of the final uh, exhibition. It's actually still being opened uh, as we speak. Uh, but this was the, the optics gallery, uh, dark on purpose because of the phenomena. And already you're starting to see the kind of engagement that, that we hope to see and ultimately the reason why we, we do what we do. All right, so that was Kujeli, Turkey. Tinkering. We created a tinkering studio in Saudi Arabia. Now, I, I left out before one of the most important aspects of the new direction of global studios is we are looking to create experiences beyond just museums and in informal centers of learning. This is not something that we've created. We're, we firmly believe that there's uh, learning happening in more and more and more places. That's a good thing. There's a greater access to tools, learning materials. There's a democratization of ideas. So how do we do what we do beyond the settings in which we are, in theory, so comfortable? So we created a, a tinkering program in uh, Al-Kabar, Saudi Arabia, which is on the Gulf side of Saudi Arabia. This was an audacious project for us. This was not on the surface an easy place to work. And our goals were huge. Once again, we did not want to just create a tinkering studio, lift it from the Exploratorium. This is a picture of our tinkering studio, which is hands-on making an exploration of materials on our floor. Um, already in a museum setting, this is an innovative uh, and uh, approach to learning. And uh, uh, many museums around the country are working to figure out just how you might do this in a museum environment, never mind in, in a foreign country without all of the amenities that you would have in a museum. And not only creating 
a museum, we wanted to create the capacity for people to facilitate and train and lead the activities that are associated with tinkering on their own after we had left. Once again, in SketchUp, we created a model of what it might look like. The great challenge here was, you'll see in a second, this is happening in a tent in a big open area. And the activities in tinkering require a certain focus and contemplation and uh, a well-defined space. So we did our best to try and create that. Right up here, you can see this big open patch of sand is where the event was going to happen. It was sponsored by Saudi Aramco. And their headquarters are here in uh, Al Khabar. And in a matter of weeks, what sprung up from this patch of sand was nothing short of remarkable. First, the tents are erected. And this is our truck showing up with a tinkering studio in boxes. And this, our tinkering studio sat outside in 120 degree heat and sand. So we, we had to do a serious amount of remediation in the field, particularly for the group that is very particular about the nature of their experience and uh, 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 the comfort level, the accessibility, the invitation that exists by creating a space like this. We found that, just as a side note, that it was so hot that you're familiar with butcher block, like yay thick, it was cracking that in half, which is not supposed to happen. So we needed a lot of work in the field. Now, I don't know if anybody here can read Arabic, but I'll bet you know that branding scheme. <laughs> It's the same in Saudi Arabia as it, as it is here. There were a lot of trips to IKEA in trying to turn what we had created and what we hoped would transplant nicely to a tent in Saudi Arabia into a rather warm environment. Now, as I mentioned before, creating the physical space was just part of the program. We began immediately, even as we were setting up the space, training 16 Saudi educators that were chosen to work alongside of the educators that we sent. So we sent uh, uh, around eight to 12 educators in pairs of, of two over the course of this five week festival to work alongside their counterparts from Saudi Arabia, thereby training them hands on in the facilitation of the tinkering activities. This is what the tent looked like on opening night. Um, and remember how I said we're trying to focus on contemplative activities. Very quickly, the space turned into this. And it was a zoo. There were over 5,000 people uh, that, that came on average every day. And yet, at the same time, if we zoom in, we actually were able to create these intimate experiences, these moments of learning, of inquiry, of, of joy. And some of the best pictures I've ever seen came from this project in Saudi Arabia. This is actually one of my, my favorite pictures. Um, if, if the eyes can telegraph anything, you can see the, the joy, the wonder, the sense of accomplishment, of agency. And these are things that we work so hard to achieve. On the note of culture, uh, uh, maybe even preempting some questions, working in a place like Saudi Arabia that such, has such a profoundly different culture from ours raised all kinds of interesting considerations, as you can imagine. It is not our place to judge other cultures, and it's not our place to say what is right or wrong. And at the same time, there was one very specific uh, uh, question, and that was gender. So working in Saudi Arabia, uh, it's, it's a much different society. And from our perspective, we had conversation about how we might approach that, indeed, even if we would approach it. And in the end, uh, we, from what we figured is the, the impact of doing what we do which should be culture agnostic, learning, inquiry, agency, all of these things, we felt have their own merit and are important. There was one thing that we wanted was that both the participants in the booth and those that we trained would be of mixed gender. It was the one stipulation that we presumed to make, and it was OK. So in the end, uh, we had both men and women in the booth, and we had both men and women being trained as facilitators. One of my favorite pictures also. Now, the professional development didn't end just at the beginning of the project. We made it a point on a daily and weekly basis to continue discussion and dialogue about what we were doing and how we were doing it with the goal by the end of the five week festival, transferring facilitation of the booth 100% to the Saudi facilitators. And that's exactly what we did. Um, they're wearing some of the uh, exploratory vest, as you can see. And by the end of the festival, our facilitators had receded into the background. 
And not only were they working on facilitating the booth, they were maintaining, as you can imagine, in that kind of heat and that kind of usage, it was a constant uh, battle, if you will, just to keep everything in, in, in working order. And then on an ongoing basis, this is just a picture of a social media page. We had hoped, and it turned out to be so, that we would leave the tinkering studio behind, and we would leave behind communities that were inspired to continue these kinds of activities. And the tinkering studio is still in Saudi Arabia, and it's traveling from cultural program to cultural program with a permanent home in a museum uh, uh, in, in the capital of, of Riyadh. And the, the connections that were made between us at the Exploratorium and our counterparts in Saudi Arabia continue to this day. So the third uh, project I'd like to share is right here at home um, at uh, UC, uh, UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. This was uh, closer to home, but also a radically new project for us with, as you can imagine, its own considerations and constraints. Uh, the genesis of the project was uh, uh, through a group called Child Life uh, that operates a learning center within the hospital. And they have a, a, a San Francisco Unified Accredited School as well. They had already worked with the Exploratorium in, uh, uh, in outreach programs and activities for years. So there was already a relationship. And they were moving themselves from their Parnassus campus to their new campus in, uh, in Mission Bay. We had to step back and think about visitorship, obviously, in a whole new way. And we had so much to learn about what happens in that kind of environment. And so many of the assumptions that we would have going in, uh, uh, we were challenged with uh, right out of the gate. Uh, one example is, uh, and this may be obvious on the surface, but the people who use those exhibits are not only patients. They're siblings of patients, they're family members, they're people who come to visit, visit patients. And there's a wide variety, as wide as you can imagine, of, of, of ability and, um, uh, uh, and presence and, and, and state of being. And we couldn't cater to just one. And in fact, that would be a shame. How do you make it so different levels of ability uh, can experience what we create? The other aspect of the building is oh, the obligatory design picture. That hospital is immense. And there's way more opportunity than we could possibly do in one project or could possibly do before we learn enough to do it. So we had to look at the entire environment and choose where we would start off with our, our, our experiences. This is our high-tech uh, database system that's, that's showing exactly how we would approach the different exhibits and different experiences. And then, of course, we began sketching. And we were looking at hallways. We were looking at alcoves at the edge of the museum. Uh, pieces in the lobby, and of course, in patients' uh, rooms. Again, as you can imagine, much different levels of activity and engagement in each of these places. We began prototyping with our counterparts at UCSF, who were just a pleasure to work with. There was so much simpatico about our approach to learning. Um, prototyping a colored shadows exhibit. And of course, we, we got into the building and prototyped in the room itself. This is an animation station uh, uh, where you're able to move different pieces and materials and create your own uh, animations. And in the end, it led to a piece in the lobby, which is uh, a polarized lenses going over uh, a scotch tape and, uh, a, and, and glass or acrylic. And if you look at each of these works of art, they're participatory. We didn't create them. They're actually being created by patients. Uh, uh, up in their rooms or wherever they're able to be working. So it can be done in a classroom. It can be done in their room if they can't move. Even some of the more uh, ill and long-term patients can still be doing this in, in their own spaces um, and have a way of sharing what you do with the rest of the hospital. Um, and I haven't talked a lot uh, about the, the goals, but in a setting like this, it was really important to the child life experts that it was indeed about that. It was about life and the fact that learning is still continuing and you are able to explore and do whatever you're able to do. It was, a, um, it was an incredibly moving project to work on. We created exhibits and experiences in a surgical waiting area. A lot of classical exploratory exhibits chosen to be contemplative in a space that you do not want to be incredibly active in because of the nature of the space. We created a time lapse. Uh, uh, exhibit looking out over the bay. So there's a beautiful view from the new Mission Bay campus looking out over the bay. And you can scrub through 
a, a day at different speeds, and it's actually quite fascinating. Ships are coming and going, weather patterns are changing, and again, this is a way of getting somebody out of what might feel like the alternate reality of their confined hospital environment, exploring phenomena in the real world. We created images on the wall. Uh, again, something very simple, doesn't require a lot of uh, interactivity or hands-on, but still a, a content-rich experience. Um, we programmed the garage. Uh, very simple here, we created animals and pixelated uh, uh, dots uh, for each floor of the garage. A scope in a patient's room, the animation station that I just mentioned, and the final embodiment of the colored shadows, which is just a, a wonderful exhibit, a very playful exhibit, where really the only goal is, is exploring the phenomena of light and optics and transforming an environment uh, uh, into uh, a, a work of art. So if you step back and look at this uh, uh, body of work, um, you can tell that from our perspective, we are just scratching the surface. Each of these areas we chose because we hope that it's extensible. Uh, we worked in one hospital. Uh, our hope and the hope of the folks at Parnassus is that, or at Mission Bay, is that we have created a model for how you might work with hospitals. In Tinkering, we created a model for how you might take something that is, uh, in, in one sense, something so particular to the Exploratorium and relies on such particular constraints and put it out into the world in places where you do not have controls on, that constraints, on those constraints and create uh, uh, broader experiences. And our approach to museum making, even though that might seem conventional on the surface, that if you were to create new science centers around the world, can we take an approach that is as focused on culture and learning and affect as it is on design uh, and exhibits? Over the last three years, Global Studios' breadth has grown. We are uh, four times in scope what we were before. I know that might be another day in the office in the valley, but where we are, that's, that's profound growth, and we see that as, as just the tip of the iceberg. So with that, I guess I'll pause and, and, and see if there are uh, any questions. Have you ever worked with kids to come up with ideas for uh, your exhibit? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, there's, there's two answers to that. The first is the way that we prototype. The ideas are out on the floor and so constantly refined that it's hard to say that they're not, right? They're a part of the team that allows us to create what we create. Uh, I didn't mention, mention this in the outset, but we see our floor as a learning laboratory, as, as a research crucible, um, and the visitors are a huge part of that. Um, the other answer is one of our great interests as part of the move was finding a way of engaging more and more people into our creative process. So you could say that X percent of the Exploratorium wasn't even created here. We still have a ways to go, but it's something that we're very much interested in. What's the minimal level of infrastructure required for you to do one of these mobile Exploratoriums? Electric power, water, et cetera? That's a great question. Um, my knee-jerk answer is I want to say zero, <laughs> right? That it, you can, you know, if you look at the Teacher Institute and you look at the snacks that they've created that are uh, uh, very lightweight versions of the phenomena-rich exhibits that we've created over the years, that you could do it just with found objects and a table, right? So really, I think it's about the, the, the scale and depth of engagement. For Global Studios, for my particular group, we tend to be at a larger scale uh, where our partners are often institutions or countries or, 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 or governments, uh, educational groups that have the resources to try and manifest something at a larger scale. Um, but we always try and think small when it comes to the actual experiences themselves. So I would hate to answer with a threshold that would you know, uh, uh, eliminate uh, the kind of experiences we would want to create in any, any given setting. Do you ever have a mandate? So for example, perhaps the museum in Turkey, um, you, know, you must cover, I noticed the solar system was on there. And that one kind of struck me because I thought, how do you tinker about the solar system? You can't send people to Mars. Um, and I guess I, my, my question was, did that come out organically, or was that, or was that kind of part of the agreement was that that was something they wanted to cover, and you had to figure out how to approach that subject matter? That's a great question. I mean, interestingly enough, the exploratorium approach tends to be content agnostic. 
Um, it, it's more important to us the learning pathway than a particular learning outcome. That said, uh, that isn't necessarily the point of departure for our would-be partners and colleagues all around the world. And it's a question that we have to answer constantly. Um, the further upstream we are in the creative process, the easier it is for us to have conversations about how important it is to think about the learning culture you want to create, the pedagogical approach to learning, as opposed to saying that this is about nuclear power or it's about solar power. Power comes up a lot, particularly as you can imagine in the Middle East. Um, some projects, it's already so woven into their expectations that it's not something that we could change. And then there's a question of um, how literal we have to be. Um, you can imagine that if it's about power, there are a bunch of exhibits at the Exploratorium that would work because of the fundamental science below it, as opposed to a didactic you know, demonstration of this is solar power. And you know, here's a model that shows solar power. So you can get excited about solar power and care about maybe this company that's behind the exhibition. Um, we're very careful about how we choose our partners. We don't think there's anything wrong about having a content outcome, but we find that our partnerships work best when we are not uh, restricted to a predetermined content set, or at least the embodiment of how you approach that content set from an experiential standpoint, if that makes sense. I saw uh, as you were going through the galleries, you had the science of sharing, and then uh, I, I was at the Exploratorium, and I saw a lot of the more classic experiments that were from like the 70s, let's say. I guess when you're looking forward, what do you think the experiments of the future are going to look like? Because they, they do kind of feel different, those science of sharing exhibits from the earlier ones. I mean, what, where do you kind of see things going? Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny, as I was, it was, I was joking early on about uh, how hard it would be to try to get everything I would want to say into a talk. Um, the science of sharing area is one of the most interesting areas we're working on. And uh, I would start by saying that even within the Exploratorium, when there was first dialogue about approaching sociology as a content set in science of sharing, there was internal dialogue about whether it could be done. And more specifically, whether it could be done uh, the way we like to do it, more specifically, authentic phenomena, right? So how do you translate uh, people and sharing into something that would be other than a model or a simulation of that or a computer screen that says, here's how people share and here's what it is. That was our great challenge. Um, we've done it, uh, and I think we've done it well, but we have a lot to learn. If you were to look at that gallery, it has less of a, that frenetic feel that you might see in our, our central gallery where people are bouncing from exhibit and there's a lot of stimuli that in the, the, the West Gallery, Science of Sharing, there's a little more stepping back. It's a little more contemplative. And interestingly enough, our answer to how you make it authentic phenomena is the visitors are the exhibit. So a, a great example would be our trust fountain, which is we call Sipper Squirt, which is a play on the prisoner's dilemma, you know, the, the classic, classic uh, uh, sociological phenomena, you know, where if um, two people are, are uh, arrested, they're in cahoots, they're put in separate rooms, and basically you say, you rat out your friend, you go free, you rat out your friend, you go free, right? And if they both rat each other out, they both go to jail. If neither one rats each other out, they both go free, and if one rats one out, then one goes to jail and one doesn't, and vice versa. So we created a water fountain, which is called, which is sip or squirt, where you can choose whether you give a sip of water to the person across from you or a squirt, and it follows those same rules, a squirt of water in the face. And so the nature of the phenomena isn't so much, or as I should say, isn't only the two people playing the game, it's the people who are standing around observing, and you get into game theory, and you get into uh, um, the actual phenomena itself in an observational way. So it is different for us. I think uh, we have so much more to learn, but it's also part of, of our own growth in that for it to be an authentic exploratory experience and a deep learning experience, does it have to look the way it always has? And one of the great promises, again, of the move for us was perhaps getting us out of our own comfort zone. Um, it's one of the reasons we presume to be able to work with the world in ways that we do now, um, where they don't have the same expectations of, uh, that we would for, our, for experience. So uh, I don't know where that goes in time, but I think the fact that we're pushing on those parameters and playing in that way is actually us being true to ourselves in some new and interesting ways. I'm curious if you could talk more about what you said about culture being um, sort of a hard roadblock when you're going to a new country. How do you figure out what you need to change about the exhibits for different cultures, and how do you figure out what's going to work? 
Yeah, we don't have an answer for that one yet. I mean, it has to start off with an awful lot of humility, and it has to start off with an awful lot of listening, and it has to start off with the presumption that um, doing it our way, which we're a very thick culture, and we have very firm understandings about the ways we like to do things, um, it requires a certain flexibility in our approach, um, and knowing where we think how we do something is very important, and knowing how it's going to have to adapt or change if it's going to be in a new place. Um, it's been a lesson for us to basically say, if you can meet a, a, a certain situation or culture part way and find an intersection of expectations on their side and expectations on our side, that's a toehold. And that toehold is a wonderful thing. It may not be all the way towards what we would hope and want, but you cannot recreate San Francisco everywhere. Uh, a great concrete example is we're doing work in China right now. And uh, uh, China has created some of the, the largest and most magnificent uh, museums and science centers in the world. It's staggering the scale and speed with which they've built them. Um, and now there is dialogue about how you would create cultures of innovation and cultures of learning and a sustainable R&D culture um, uh, in China writ large and as part of the science center movement there. What would a second generation of science centers look like? And the instinct will be to go very quickly. How fast can you build something? How can you have an immediate transfer of knowledge such that we're there? Um, done marvelous things with that approach, but that's not our approach. We come in and we say, you realize this is going to take a really long time. It's going to be messy. There will not be immediate visible results. It's very longitudinal. So that can't be a reason not to work together. And we can't come in thinking the way we do it is right. Um, and if you try and introduce speed in the absolute or you try and introduce scale in the absolute, it can't work. We have to find a way to say um, there's merit in working together. How do we find a way at some scale to introduce what we do in a way that can demonstrate impact faster? Um, just one example, uh, but in the end, the truth is uh, uh, we are just scratching the surface, really, of understanding how, as an institution, uh, we approach such questions. Cool. Um, any last message for tinkers and makers and educators out there? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say that I think it's an incredible time. I mean, anybody who's, who's, who's been a participant in the maker movement or education, whether it's formal or informal. Um, the resources that are out there, the accessibility that exists, the ways in which you can think in associative and interesting ways, the fact that there are standards changing from a government perspective, there's ways in which countries can work together as never before. Um, it's just an extraordinary time, and uh, it's going to be fun to learn over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Thank you so much. This is so inspirational. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.